Well, welcome to the podcast, everyone. And today, you know what? I've got an amazing guest. She's from the beautiful Napa part of California. So we've been having a bit of a chat before we got started about the wines and the lovely, lovely areas she lives in. But she's a behavioral specialist. And the reason I got this lady on is since we've now started to come out of COVID, a lot of things have now started to come to the fruition. People got hidden during these last three years. And now they're all starting to come out. And we have some real challenges, especially around Alzheimer's and dementia. And especially with a lot of business people who are are finding the the high-functioning people are coming out with this as well. So we're going to have a bit of a chat. We're going to debunk a few myths. We're going to learn a lot. And Lisa Skinner is going to tell us everywhere and everything about where she is and what she does. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Well, thank you so much. And thank you very much for having me on the show. I appreciate it very much. So what part of you live in Napa? Have you always been in that part of California or did you move in? I grew up in the next county over called yes. Marin yeah. County, which is so Napa, Marin County, then San Francisco. Mm. But yes, that's where I grew up and um, moved into Napa. My husband grew up here and mm. we chose this as kind of where we wanted to plant the roots for the rest of our lives. And I just love it here. So the most important question for our listeners, are you a red wine drinker or a white wine drinker? It depends on the season. <laughs> I like, and I love the blush. Yes. And what's the blush? Yes. You call it? It's um, a combination of uh, white and red. They don't mm. take the skins off of the um, the white. So it's yep. pinkish. Oh, yeah. Like uh, a rosé. Yes, color. it's a rosé. Yes, yes, it is a rosé. So we're going to today talk about Alzheimer's and dementia, and we're going to, we'll do, delve into what is the difference, because we do get confused a lot. But your journey to get to here, how did you end up being a specialist in this field? It was really kind of following the yellow brick road mm-hmm. and getting to um, the scarecrow and trying to make a decision which way to go. Mm. And I picked one and this is where it landed me. But that said, my very first experience with Alzheimer's disease was with a family member. And since then, I have had eight family members um, live with Mm -hmm. dementia. And when I say live with, when I say live with dementia, I mean, one of the brain diseases that causes dementia, and we can get into Mm. that, because there are actually over 100 diseases that cause dementia, which is not a specific illness, it's really a syndrome. Alzheimer's disease is the most common brain disease that causes dementia. That's what I was about to ask, what's the difference, because people do get confused. They do. They do. And it's a great question. And it's a great place to start to um, differentiate between Mm. the two. So as I mentioned, Alzheimer's disease is a brain disease. Mm. It is um, a disease that causes damage to various parts of the brain. It typically Mm. starts with the short term memory and it causes all kinds of signs and symptoms. And as I also mentioned, there are over a hundred brain diseases that Mm. do cause dementia. So when we use the word dementia, we're really referring to an umbrella term that describes the symptoms and the signs and the behaviors that accompany these brain diseases. And there's probably over a hundred of those. So we're we're putting all of those into one bucket and calling it dementia. So it would be very similar to you coming down with symptoms and going to the doctor and, and describing your symptoms. Oh my gosh, I've got a fever and I've got body aches and I've got chills and I've got a splitting headache. And then you are there because you want your doctor to tell you if it's the flu, if it's COVID, if it's a cold. Mm -hmm. So you're describing your symptoms. That's what dementia is, the symptoms. So a quick question. It appears that a lot of high functioning individuals, uh, as we, you kind of highly intelligent individuals 
come down with this? Is there is there any data or anything to say that they're more susceptible, or is it because yes. most of the time they're high profile? What what where is the truth there? Okay, so there are many many risk factors that go into kind of the um, cause or a person's risk mm -hmm. for developing Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. We have category of what we call non-modifiable risk factors. And that is age because age is the number one risk factor of dementia or of yeah. Alzheimer's disease and dementia. By the time a person is 65 years old, that's when the disease typically starts to show up. And every five years after the age of 65, a person's risk of developing Alzheimer's disease doubles. So when a person is uh, reaches the age of 85, the statistics tell us today, one out of three people will have it. So do you think, we used to call it old age. When my grandfather would forget something, that's just old age, he's just an old guy. But that's not necessarily true because anyone's memory starts to go as you get older. If you don't use it, you lose it, as they say. And that's a big difference. I have a near 90-year-old auntie who's got it, and her brother had it, but he only lasted six months. He had an incident, which we'll talk about later, and he went downhill very quick. And it was only then I started to understand that there's different types of Alzheimer's and the behaviour uh, is very different and her what she has is very different to what he had still is the root cause so is there a difference between old age and alzheimer's or is it just different there, levels no there's a huge difference between what we call uh normal aging mm -hmm. normal aging process yep. um and there is uh, memory loss that's associated with normal aging, just like you said. And then there's mild cognitive impairment, which can progress into Alzheimer's disease or, or one okay. of the other brain diseases. And then you actually have the brain disease. And just as you said, we kind of have a saying in our industry mm -hmm. that if you've met one person with dementia, you've only met one person with dementia because everybody progresses through the stages of dementia differently. Mm. So, and then the other thing that I think a lot of people aren't aware of it and is actually more common than we would think is a lot of people suffer from what we call mixed dementia. So they can have two or three brain diseases occurring in their brains at the same time. And uh, each one can affect a different area of the brain. So they would probably display a lot more of what we call the dementia symptomology than if it was just one. But like I said, everybody experiences it differently. So um, you kind of need, almost need to understand the um, the repercussions of brain disease and the different signs and symptoms and be able to recognize those to um, really understand what's happening to your loved one and then be able to effectively react and respond to the behaviors that are associated, understand why these behaviors show up. Um, you know, some people hallucinate and they have delusions and they become paranoid, mm -hmm. but not yep. everybody does. So, uh, so yeah, they vary from person to person, the symptomology that they display with the disease that they are personally experiencing. And this is why I practice what's called person-centered care. Mm -hmm. And person-centered care is a state-of-the-art um, methodology that really focuses on the individual and the symptoms that they're displaying and the cause of their dementia. And then a care plan is developed around that individual. So instead of focusing on the disease, you're focusing on the individual person. So does stress 
or people who run high, hugely successful businesses, and some of them are very stressed and some of them are pretty relaxed. Can stress bring dementia on? It can. And again, um, if we kind of piggyback to the risk factors, mm -hmm. you've got the modifiable risk factors and the non-modifiable risk factors. Again, age is number one. Ethnicity is a non-modifiable. Your gender is non-modifiable. Women tend to get mm. Alzheimer's more than men. And, is that because um, their that, husbands drive them nuts? That's right. Yeah. That's exactly so. right. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you, Scientists don't really know the definitive reason for why women do, but um, they believe it's because women outlive men. And again, yeah, the older you get, yeah. your chances of developing Alzheimer's increase uh, every five years. It doubles. We're hearing stories now of people getting Alzheimer's earlier and earlier. Is it because we're better at diagnosing it or is it? because the world's changed and people's their minds seem to be aging quicker than they ever were. Well, those are two, actually two different diseases. You have the regular Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease, which, which still shows up um, usually starting at the age of 65. Mm -hmm. And then there is the rarer form of Alzheimer's disease, which is called early onset. And that typically strikes people at a younger age than 65. I mean, in, I, I've known of people who've been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease in their 30s. And it typically progresses much faster than the um, typical Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why we're seeing so, the numbers excel in the way they are because the World Health Organization and the Alzheimer's Association are projecting that just by the year 2050, which is not that far away, we will see the number of Alzheimer's disease, uh, people develop it will tr almost triple just in the next 25, 26 years, which is staggering. And one of the reasons is because the baby boomers are the largest population. Yes, and they're an aging population, yes. And they're an aging population. And the other reason, I think, is due to the non the modifiable risk factors, which include medical conditions, like the number one modifiable risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease is cardiovascular disease. But that's manageable. Really? Sleep I never knew that. Yes, diabetes is a huge risk factor for people developing Alzheimer's disease, sleep apnea, hearing loss. Oh, there's just a, a, a myriad of, of um, things that play into increasing somebody's risk factors. So if you put the non-modifiable risk factors into a bucket, and then you start adding in the modifiable ones, you're just increasing your chances of developing Alzheimer's disease that much for every one of these um, medical conditions that you're not managing. And then on top of that, you have lifestyle risk factors. So diet plays a huge role in uh, reducing your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Exercise plays a huge role. And these are all studies that have been done for decades that show a direct correlation between these risk factors and your risk as an individual in developing Alzheimer's disease. Is it a specific diet or is it just a healthy diet helps? Um, it, what's recommended, a healthier diet is recommended, but the ideal diet would be similar to a Mediterranean diet, which would include um, leaner meats, fish, mm -hmm. um, less red meats. I mean, if you stick to the true Mediterranean diet, you're not eating any red meats, but you know, everything in moderation. Well, that's not going to go down well in California or in Australia. Yeah, we're, we're big steak eaters here. Yes. Green leafy vegetables. But the most important thing is to stay away from simple carbohydrates mm -hmm. and eat more complex car carbohydrates. In other words, grains, 
and less sugar or no sugar, mm. um, white things, your white potatoes, your white rice, your white bread, these are all simple carbohydrates that spike your sugar. And then again, causes inflammation, systemic inflammation in the body. And there mm. is a correlation between inflammation and developing Alzheimer's disease. Inflammation, say arthritis. Well, there's also inflammation mm. in the brain. There's yeah. inflammation in the body. And exercise plays a very important role in reducing your risk, regular exercise, and also um, keeping your brain active and stimulated. So mm. the number one thing that's recommended to, I mean, like crossword puzzles, oh. but the number one thing that's recommended for reducing your risk and keeping your brain active is learning a foreign language. And it just so happens that it's the parts of the brain that it takes to learn a foreign language, you know, translate it from one language to another that really stimulates your brain activity. Um, learning a, a musical instrument is another good one, but sitting in front of a television set um, hour after hour after hour, no, no, that does not stimulate your brain. No, it doesn't, doesn't. If you're part of a large family and you have a lot of people in your family as they got older, ended up with Alzheimer's. What is the best way for someone to see the early markers so they can see what's starting to happen? What, what are the early signs that people need to look out for in their loved ones? So this will go back to um, the one that we started on the normal aging process yeah. and cognitive impairment yep. versus Alzheimer's disease or mm. one of the other brain diseases. Um, it's very difficult to tell. And this is part of our challenge is in the early stages of developing Alzheimer's mm. disease or one of the other brain diseases, the signs and the symptoms are very subtle and it's very difficult to differentiate in a person, whether or not this is just normal aging, you know, we stick our glasses on top of our head and we're looking everywhere for them. I know we've all probably all done that. Uh, can't find our keys. I mean, this is all part of the normal aging process, having a conversation with somebody, and then all of a sudden, the person's name that you're trying to say just flies out of your head. I mean, these are things that happen to me. And um, a lot of people and I have a lot of people come to me and, and tell me that this is happening to them. And they're worried that maybe they're developing Alzheimer's. Not necessarily. Most people today are not even diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease until they're already well into the mid stages because the signs are so subtle in the beginning. What I tell people is when the signs reach a point where it's really impacting a person's ability to function on a daily basis, that's your red flag, that's your sign that there's probably something more serious going on. By that point, most people are already in the mid stage of the disease. And uh, a lot of the um, treatments and or cures that are um, being announced, like there's a new drug that was just announced, but everything to date only helps you if you're in your very early stages. And um, you had raised this question a little earlier, it's a very, very difficult disease to diagnose. The mm. only definitive diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease right now is an autopsy. So the way a doctor or a neurologist uh, diagnoses Alzheimer's disease is really through a process of elimination. Mm. But um, some of the things that you might want to look for that are signs that it might be a more serious mm. situation is um, a person all of a sudden developing a difficult time um, finding words when they're talking to you. They might forget a word. They might struggle to think of what that word is and they can't. So they replace it with something that yeah. makes absolutely no sense, no sense in that sentence. And we call that confabulation. Mm. Um, they might just refer to something because they can't think of the name as, oh, you know, that thing, that thing in the jig. 
um, there's a, you know, a, a variety of different ways that they'll try to make up for not being able to think of the word. Yeah. One of the most common things that people do when they are developing Alzheimer's disease is repeat questions over and over and over yes. and over and over well, again. I was going to get to that when I talk about my auntie in a moment. Well, that's very common. Um, in, in the same conversation, or they'll tell you the same story over yes. and over and over again in the same conversation. I think that is um, a pretty significant sign that something is more serious wrong, seriously wrong with them than just the normal aging forgetfulness problem. And then if you notice that a person is having a difficult time doing certain uh, activities of daily living, they're struggling. Like they've probably been turning their coffee maker on and preparing their coffee or their tea for decades. And then all of a sudden they can't figure out how to work that coffee maker or mm. make themselves a pot of tea or balance their checkbook. Um, so these are all significant early signs of dementia versus normal aging. I'll give it my auntie and uncle. My uncle was a monsignor in the Catholic Church, incredibly intelligent man, high functioning, <clears throat> difficult man. But he had, he was going to visit my auntie <clears throat> and he had a minor car accident. He uh, hit a lady on a, who was walking on a frame. <clears throat> Within six months, he was dead. They diagnosed him, the, the, the trauma did something to him in his brain and he got full on Alzheimer's like instant. So he was, and he his went brain, violent his... and he's never been violent in his life. Yeah, and this he went happens. Downhill very quick and we had to stop seeing him because he wasn't the man that we knew. It wasn't, his body was there, his mind wasn't. And yeah. many people say, well, he, they say the soul's gone and it's the body still not. This is how some people deal with it. And this is the body right. still hanging on after the soul of the person is gone because it's not the person they know. But my auntie, five, six years later, is still going. Another, she always looked after herself. Very, very intelligent. But she does is what you call the looping. And she'll ask the same question over and over again. She's physically fit. If she's tired, the symptoms come out further. And she's aware that she has it. About 50% of people are aware. So here's two different versions. So some people say the same disease. And you said, how does that work? How does someone who was physically fit have an incident and within six months pass? and be a totally different person to what they were. Yet my auntie is still healthy. She's slowly losing her mind. She doesn't remember a lot. And other days she's back on it. And it's, as you said, it's very, very different. So yeah. my first question before I go to the one after is, how can one disease be so, so opposite and still have the same... You know, ending. well, it sounds like your uncle was suffering from a traumatic brain injury, and that causes a very similar or the same mm -hmm. symptomology as some of the other brain diseases. A person mm -hmm. can be suffering from multiple brain diseases, we call yeah. that mixed dementia, and uh, it affects each person individually. So, yeah. um a six, six month lifespan from the onset of symptoms is yeah. extremely fast. The average person lives eight to 15 years. Yeah. My grandmother lived 20. Um, other people live, you know, 14, 15, and other people live six, seven, eight. It depends on what's going on with that individual's brain and how quickly the disease is progressing. So it's probably going to progress. And like I said earlier, it seems to progress much faster if somebody has early onset yep. than they do if they have just the traditional form of Alzheimer's. 
but they could be suffering from multiple brain diseases. They so so it really comes down to the individual person and what's happening with them. And a lot of times the doctors aren't able to tell you that you have um, mixed dementia. Sometimes they mm. are, sometimes they aren't. So again, you really have to look at the individual person versus the disease to really uh, determine the best approach to that yeah. person and their illness. Um, repetitive questions, repetitive stories. That's a very common um, symptom of that's that, and it usually happens earlier on than later on, like in the later stages. Yeah. And probably one of the first clues that there's really something um, serious going on. So what's um, the best way? So I'm the equivalent of her son, but she could, I'm a grandson because she was my mum's sister. They don't have children. So it's up to me and one of the other cousins. We look after her and her husband. What are some tips that we can have? Like when I ring up, I tell her who it is before she gets to ask. So she doesn't be embarrassed. It doesn't trigger it. What are some of the things we can do to help them so we don't put them in a situation where they either they know that they can't answer or they've forgotten, so you don't want to embarrass them, but you still need to manage it? I mean, there, there must be some things that we can do better to help people oh. like my auntie. Yes, there are. And the key to unlocking the... I guess the secrets, the, the strategies, number one is understand this disease and it's what it's doing to the brain of the person and um, learn the signs and the symptoms that accompany the disease. So the behavioral changes, the personality changes, mm. uh, the outbursts, because that's more rare than not. It um, is rare, yes, yeah. Yes, a lot of people associate Alzheimer's disease exclusively with memory loss and confusion. It is so much more complicated than that. And I have been listening to family members for almost 30 years tell me that their loved one all of a sudden is now crazy because of um, this disease, but they're not really connecting the dots that... Mm. These behaviors that they're seeing are 100% related to the damage being done in the brain. So what I advise people to do is educate themselves, learn what's happening to the person, know the signs and the symptoms that crop up on a daily basis, and then probably as importantly is learn the best practices for reacting to those behaviors because there is a right way and there is a way of reacting that can cause what we call a catastrophic reaction if the situation is not managed properly. I find so, clear communication keeps her relaxed. So like direct communication and where she doesn't have to think of an answer. Yes. She, it's like a black and white answer. It seems to work better than I would never ask her now, what does she think? Because that's well, even your approach to identifying yourself when you first call is um, always a, a best practice. Like you say, for several reasons, you're not putting that person on a spot, on the spot mm. where they have to feel shame or embarrassment that they don't know who they're talking to. Yes. And then another really important tip is if somebody starts talking about things who has Alzheimer's disease or one of the other brain diseases, and they start talking about things that don't make sense to you in your reality. They're talking about, maybe they don't recognize you as mm. their son or their grandson. It's because their short-term memory basically has short-circuited for that time being, and they're mm. pulling their memories from the past because mm. our long-term memories stay intact for 
usually the duration of the disease or at least until the late, the very end stage. So you have to listen for the cues of what they're talking about. And then the best practice for responding to that so you don't escalate the situation and have it turn into a catastrophic reaction is to do what we call join their reality and just go along with it. Because I'm telling you, I'm trust me on this, there is absolutely nothing that anybody can say or do to try to steer that person back into your reality. This is their reality for the time being. Mm. But in the middle stages of the disease, it's, it's kind of temporary. Think of it like um, a, a light, a lamp hooked up to a switch. And in the middle stages of the disease, that switch flips on and it flips off. And you can tell if somebody's short-term memory switch is flipped off based on what they're talking about. But it's usually temporary in the mid-stage. In the early stage of the disease, that switch is on more than it's off. And as they progress into the mid-stage, it's about 50-50. Sometimes it's on and sometimes it's off. Again, true, listen true, to yeah. If they start talking about, have you seen my daughter? Um, I'm here to pick her up from daycare. Well, that doesn't make sense to you because her daughter is 50 years oh. old. But in her mind, sh that switch got flipped off. She's pulling from her past memories. And in her mind, she's probably a 25, 30 year old woman with a young child that she went to pick up from daycare or wants to make cookies for. I see people revert back to, it's kind of like living your life in reverse. Mm -hmm. See people asking for their mommies and their daddies because in their mind, they're young toddlers living at home with their parents. So if you listen for the cues, then it's easy to identify if that Mem short term memory switches functioning or not functioning, but it does go on and off on a regular basis in that mid stage. And then typically in the end stage, it's either off most of the time or it is uh, completely their short term memory is completely re re erased and they now are living at a past time frame in their life. And that's where they're stuck. And they believe that is the time frame that they're living in. And there's nothing anybody can do or say to convince them otherwise. So you really have to adapt to their reality and not try to make them come back to yours. So two quick questions before we start to wrap up. How important is structure when you're living with someone with Alzheimer's? It's like very structured important. Day. Yeah. It's very important. And this is where a lot of, um, especially since COVID, we're seeing mm. a huge shift in caring for loved ones with yes, true. Alzheimer's disease. And a lot of families are trying to bring that loved one into their own home. Yes. And that's the one huge um, difference that I've seen between like a, a memory care unit mm. where people have been trained on caring for people with dementia uh, and people living at home. Structure is extremely important for many reasons. Familiarity, um, keeping somebody on a schedule. Um, it helps them feel safe and secure and uh you know, familiarity becomes very, very important to somebody who is suffering from brain disease. And you want to do, um, you know, activities with them and, and hopefully get have them get some exercise. These are all very important components to offering a quality of life um, a meaningful life to somebody with Alzheimer's. And these things can be done in the home if people just know how to structure um, the environment um, as opposed to being in an institutional setting. But a lot of people don't know these things and that's what I teach. So where does Alzheimer's sit on what you call the disease ladder? If you're comparing it to heart disease, uh, bone diseases, how much, how prevalent is it if you're comparing it to other things that are in 
they get a much in, higher profile. In my country, uh, it's, it, which is the United States, mm. it's the seventh leading cause of death among our elderly population. Mm. But in Finland and the Netherlands and Great Britain, it's number one cause, leading cause of death. Wow. That's how critical it's gotten. Any, is there any, have they worked out why? Um, or they, they're still going through, there must be something that's different. The world, I mean, diet would be different for one. Yeah, the world also, it, it, it's a variety of things. The mm. aging populations and then lifestyle and mm. medical conditions. But the World um, Alzheimer's Association just in the last month came out with their 2022 report. And uh, those three countries, it's the number one leading cause of death among seniors. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I see it, unfortunately, as the next global crisis mm -hmm. that's going to hit this, this world in the next 25 to 30 years. And I can honestly tell you that we're not prepared for it at all. So with all this knowledge, you must have written a book or two. I've written several books. Yeah. And yes, um, the newest one was released in January of this year. Mm. And um, it goes into a lot of what we've talked about today and kind of gives people a, bl a blueprint for understanding the disease and identifying those behaviors and signs and symptoms that we've um, mm. kind of touched on today. And then also um, best practices, because yep. those are very, very important for not only having a better quality relationship with your loved one, but helping to manage this disease. So people, family members can get back to what's really important is to uh, have quality time with their loved ones while they're True. still with us. Yes. And one of the things that I'd like to address that you mentioned is that a lot of people, because this is very true and it is a myth mm. of this disease that people's souls leave and it's just kind of a shell of a body. That's not the case at all. There is a person inside that body who feels and feels anger and feels frustration and feels hurt. And it's up to us as the family members and the caregivers to be able to recognize when they are um, having a want or a need. And by the time they're in their mid stages of the disease, they almost never can articulate what that want or their need is. So that's why it's so critical for us to recognize these behaviors because that is the way that the person living with Alzheimer's disease and dementia is trying to tell you something. It's not to be difficult. It's not mm. to be mean. It's not, they are trying to tell you something. They have a want, they have a need, they're in pain, they're hungry, they're cold. They, you know, no matter what the trigger was for that behavior, there's a reason behind it. And that's one of the um, jobs that is kind of laid on us is to figure out, we've got to put those Sherlock Holmes caps on yep. and figure out what triggered that behavior. So where do people get in contact you and buy your books and uh, say good day, as we say in Australia? Amazon. Um, our books are available on Amazon. Yep. And I'm very excited to announce that just this last week, we... Um, released our newest audio book. So that's available through Audible and you can access it through Amazon. We have a wonderful um, website called truthliesalzheimers.com. So it's www.truthliesalzheimers.com hmm. with no punctuation between those words. I have a blog um, that is called Not all who wander need be lost, which is on Facebook. Mm. And we provide a lot of information that will be helpful to caregivers and family members that will help um, 
make their journey with their loved one through this disease a lot easier, less stressful, and more manageable. And we also have a training course that we're just about to release that will actually teach people everything we talked about today. <laughs> you know what? It's been fantastic talking to someone with such passion and about something that so many of us actually are affected by, both the person that you know that's got it and normally it's the family around them that are, are more upset than the person because they actually don't realise. Oh, that's so true. Yeah. So fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, pulling yourself away from the lovely vines of California. And taking Thanks the again time for to having to everyone. me. And thank you for supporting me in trying to raise awareness to people um, who are somehow involved with this very tragic disease. Yeah, that's so true. And so what we say at the end of all of our podcasts is have a groovy day. Thank you.